spectrum. So when we're looking at, and we're talking about young migrants, we're looking at young migrants that might come in, they might come in through a study program. We have quite a significant um, study program, both at, uh, uh, if you like, a, a secondary or senior school level, as well as a tertiary, so if you like, university and um, other type of tertiary institution level. And that's, a, if you like, at one end of the spectrum. So they're often gonna come in um, supported uh, not always, but often they're going to come in supported either by family back at home or, in fact, family that travels with them. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got those that are most in need. And, of course, the, the, the ones that um, Arania was talking about, I think, were definitely in that, that sort of latter category. And these are, these are uh, young people that are in need of significant assistance, particularly if they fall into that category I spoke of of being unaccompanied. Uh, minors, so no, if you like, family mechanisms, no community mechanisms. And we have uh, had a lot of experience of that over the years, and um, I'll be frank in, in saying, because we always are, being Australian, uh, that we have got it wrong from time to time. But over that time, we've, if you like, we have uh, worked out that different um, cohorts, so different uh, people from different parts of the world, different young persons, um, uh, require different things. Sometimes it's torture and trauma counselling, and in fact, I'm not a psychologist. Obviously, Orania is and can talk to this with much greater, um, much greater expertise than, than I, but even within that subset, they're going to require a different type of, um, of, of counselling, if you like, depending on where they've come from and what they present with. And um, in trying to... I, s I started out by saying that Australia takes a whole-of-program approach to and I talked about this tiered um, and needs-based uh, type provision of services. Within that, we've got, um, and I talked about levers, and within that we've got, and I'll talk very briefly about three of those levers. Um, one of these, uh, if you like, we call them status resolution support services. So these are people that are at that acute end of the spectrum, largely because they're either asylum seekers or that they are refugees. Um, uh, but also, um, if you like, people that fall into that category are in need of protection for other reasons. So maybe fall short of, if you like, the uh, 51 convention tests, but um, still are, are in need of protection. And with those services, particularly when we're talking about uh, minors, um, so young, young migrants, if you like, uh, we've got things like live-in carer support, uh, basic clothing allowance, which you wouldn't think would be a, a major thing, but it was actually something that we identified, one of those things that we fell over in. Um, in generations past when we were dealing with our migrant flows was just that self-respect of being able to not just get second-hand clothes that are given to them out of the back of a truck, but go and buy them themselves, that sort of self-respect that comes with that. Um, educational assistance, of course, I've spoken about, and something's called support for meaningful engagement. Um, uh, one manifestation of this is with a particular, and I won't name the, the, um, uh, the cultural group, but in one of our regional areas in... Um, in one of our states within, within Australia, Victoria, in a place called um, Ballarat, uh, there was a soccer team that was, uh, it was a soccer team that was just young women. Um, so we're talking about women between the ages of 11 and 15, I understand, from a particular cultural group that was new to Australia. So we hadn't had that, that cultural group through before. And that team gave these young women a place to talk to other women that are in similar situations to their own but as well as playing other teams and, if you like, part of that um, uh, integration process, we know the, uh, the power of sport and that, that ability to interact with others, but interact with others not on their own but in a, in a, in a group. So that's uh, one um, sort of element. The next one I'll talk about very briefly is, uh, um, is uh, what we call settlement engagement and transition support. So this is kind of a... Uh, it's a two-tiered thing where we're, we're looking at the individuals, so we're looking at uh, providing advice. Now, one of the issues um, that's been identified in the questions is this engagement with the legal system. Now, we know that minors in a lot of legal systems uh, have less, um, if you like, have less capacity, shall we call it, or less ability to um, engage their rights purely because they're young. Um, we don't trust them to make decisions for themselves. We've got quite a, um, I'll call it sophisticated, um, but um, obviously I'm, I'm talking from a, an Australian self-interest point of view, but I'd say our judicial system has been dealing with this question, not just with uh, migrants, but with Australians for, for a long time. And what we've uh, done is set a statutory framework up that specifically deals with 
immigrant minors. Um, it's called the um, Immigration Guardianship of Children's Act, and it uh, specifically uh, deals with that circumstance where largely where you're talking about medical care. So where a, a young person without a guardian, so without a parent or another guardian, falls foul or falls into a situation where it's it's deemed questionable by doctors that they can actually make a decision on their own. And then we have a court system that, that um, can deal with that and we have a children's representative that's there that, that acts on their behalf and the, and the potential, not in every case of course, I mean in most extreme cases, the appointment of a guardian. And the third one I'll talk about um, is social cohesion and multicultural um, programs. This is uh, where we go to NGOs like the, um, you know, like the expertise that we've got on this panel and we go to them, what do you think we should do? And um, I might just briefly talk about the two. Um, these are specific examples. Uh, one uh, is called the Two Way Street Initiative. Um, so this is a, an NGO led initiative where my government gave um, some money over to a group in Sydney, one of our capital cities in Australia. And it was specifically targeted at young Sudanese. We have quite a large um, group of Sudanese that um, came to our country as, as refugees uh, in the uh, late 90s, um, early 2000s. And this program is specifically targeted at arming them with, I'll, I'll call it key skills and knowledge required to work in Australia. But what it is essentially is talking about us. Um, so what are our, um, our democratic values? What are um, concepts that we hold dear around equality, gender diversity? Basically learning about Australia, who we are. And it's a program that is led by in a large case, former Sudanese. We've got, we are um, fortunate in that we have had uh, a diaspora that's built up um, in that community over, over time and we've been able to leverage off that through, through a program like this. And the last one I'll talk about is the Rights and Responsibilities for Young Migrants Community Legal Education Project. Now this is in another one of our capital cities of Perth and it's um, targeted at those uh, young migrants that are in those later years of their school education, so senior school uh, level, and, um, and it, it deals with migrants that are particularly um, culturally and linguistically diverse. So we're talking about uh, non-native um, English speakers that are coming from uh, backgrounds that are quite different to what they've found themselves in, so in, in Australian society, and it's very much about educating them specifically about their rights and their responsibilities. So. Um, more about what they can do um, and what they can't do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, now we have two questions from uh, Nadia, and of course it's linked with the work of uh, Tahadi. Tahadi also provides free schooling for low income and uh, displaced children. What relationship exists between education and young people's psychological development? This is the first question, and the second one, what are your recommendations for governments, aid organizations, and other re relevant actors to further support the psychosociological psycho so well-being of migrants, refugees, and other vulnerable populations? Please. Thank you. So for us on the ground at the community level, we found that uh, focusing on education uh, is our biggest priority. Uh, we work in one specific neighborhood, as I mentioned, and we have different centers education, health, psychosocial center. Our education center is by far our largest center. We have about 300 um, children that pass through the center each day. That's from very young children through our early childhood program uh, to primary school age children and a growing focus on youth. Um, why this focus so much on education? Uh, because we, in our context, we see a lot of children that are not able to access uh, formal schooling. And that's for social reasons, economic reasons, and because it's the biggest demand from the youth themselves, from the children themselves, and from the families. Education, of course, is all about us reaching our potential and giving back to what we, uh, what we can to, to our communities. And there's a big drive from the community for this basic right. Uh, so within the education center, we provide academic um, instruction to the children and to the youth. You know, all the usual things that you might imagine in a school. And specifically with the youth, then we also work on job training uh, and vocational training. We expose them to a lot of different 
uh, types of vocation that they might consider and also provide them with job skills. The focus of the education center is also very much on social, uh, building social cohesion because it's a, one of the few places within our community that people from different backgrounds can meet together, build relationships, and work on joint projects. And through that, we also have very deliberate programs where we discuss peace building, nonviolent communication, and work on joint projects that the youth themselves design. For example, recently we had youth design programs for displaced families living in another part of the country where they would visit them on a monthly basis and provide supports uh, for them and activities. Um, when I did this exercise that I mentioned earlier with youth that are not in, a, in an education program, I sat with young mothers that were under the age of 20 who had uh, been married for a number of years. And we asked them, can you tell me again, what are the components of well-being to you? If you were to tell us, how can you be well? What things would help you be well? I was surprised, actually, but their number one thing was education. I thought, and you know, even though I've worked in that area for 10 years, I thought their, their number one answer would be jobs for their husbands, or better housing, uh, or schooling for their children. But actually, still, their primary desire was to be in school themselves. And I think this speaks volumes about the importance of education for youth, for their own sense of self, uh, and for their futures. Again and again, when we asked this question, we had this one response. Education is about our future. I don't know if my future will be here or elsewhere, but I want the tools to build my future and the future of my kids when it was uh, the mothers. This was again repeated by uh, young men who were working, again under the age of 20, who were the primary breadwinners for their family, which is common among the families we work for. It's often the youth that are the primary breadwinners with all of the stress that you might imagine. And for them also, they wanted access again to schooling. But schooling, that's flexible. And I think that gets into your second question, Diane, about uh, what are the recommendations? How can we build programs that that reach those on the margins, those that are excluded. I think that was discussed in the plenary session yesterday by um, uh, the representative from the EU, Mr. Christian, who mentioned again, what are the needs of those that are excluded? And so how can we adapt uh, our service provisions, specific, specifically education, to meet those that are not included? So for me, I often think of young mothers uh, those under the age of 25, can we build education programs that offer childcare? Can it be done in a flexible way? Can it be done in a condensed way? Moving away from these traditional uh, forms of education. Same for those of youth that are working. How can we uh, make education accessible to them? Another issue that comes up a lot with the youth we work with, whether in school or elsewhere, um, is the need for protection. So in our context, the, the school environment is a protective environment. It stands in stark contrast to the rest of the community in terms of it provides a space for youth to be safe, to be young again. They don't need to worry about violence. We don't need to worry about drugs. Uh, unfortunately, that's a growing issue uh, in our area. There's also the issue of racketeering. You know, one of the youth was telling me, you know, when I just, I want to leave my house because it's small and crowded and I want a bit of privacy. I want to sit outside. But if I sit outside, immediately, you know, a few minutes later, I have somebody come and just push me or insult me. And if I respond, I'll get into a fight. There's nowhere for me to hang out safely. So education or youth um, centers offer this, this important protection, protective environment. It also reduces uh, the chances that children will work because they're busy. Oftentimes when children are not in school and youth, I'm using the word children, uh, but I'm also meaning you know, those early teenagers who often, again, are breadwinners. If they're not in school, the temptation to keep them busy through work is very high. And I understand, actually, because the parents see if I leave them on the road in such an environment that's quite violent, most likely they're going to get into some kind of um, stressful situation. And depending on your status within the community, it's easier or harder for a parent to deal with. If they're working, they're more protected. So we need to provide alternatives to that. And I think the best alternative is our education. Uh, in terms of other recommendations, there is a need for policing that uh, is friendly to youth, policing that preserves the peace, that's not only uh, interested in, um, in uh, specific uh, uh, operations, you know, we heard we have somebody has to be arrested or we need to do a certain action, but actually policing that's uh, providing peace for youth, that's a resource to them if they feel unsafe. The issue of lack of security is often expressed even at their place of uh, refuge. So these are some quick recommendations that I have um, 
that actually come very much from the youth. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have another two questions from uh, Urania. Of course, again, it's linked with your work with uh, uh, Hestia Hellas. Can you share uh, with us techniques and strategies employed by Hestia Hellas to assist and improve the emotional well-being and build resilience of young people on the move? This is the first one. And the second, and based on your work with young migrants and refugees, what recommendation do we have for a government, aid organization, society, empower young migrants as individual and social lo level? Should specific policies to be adopted? Okay, so um, our first and most important technique is actually counseling, psychotherapy sessions, which will work through the feelings that we, I, me I mentioned before, disorientation, loneliness, insecurity. So um, these sessions bring the beneficiary in touch with reality in a way that it is tolerable. It builds up the strengths and resources of their own self and helps them then make decisions with a clearer mindset. The person is appreciated, something they are likely not to have felt during their journey or where, where they have lived. They are wel welcomed and hosted by Hestia. We recognize the deep value to them when Greek and other European citizens are warm and welcoming. So uh, within the process of psychotherapy and the relationship that forms between the therapist and the beneficiary, he or she can process the bipolar aspect of ambivalence that is hatred and or love. Maybe you don't really understand what I mean here, but just keep it in your mind and then maybe you will uh, come by it in some te text and then you will remember me. Of course, there is gratitude to the country that receives them, but feeling hatred usually doesn't have to do with, let's say, the, the Greek country. It is an emotion that derives from the fear of being abandoned, of not being wanted, and the danger of being annihilated. That's why they become aggressive. That's why they need to take it out on someone. They need to, like, if they find someone who is peaceful just sitting there, they need to go and engage with them and really take it out on them. So if someone doesn't have a place to work through these emotions and have an active participation in the process, the consequence can be profound and damaging. So it is vital for us therapists uh, not only to listen intently, but to have the capacity to comprehend and hold these intense conflicting and ambivalent feelings. If not, the bad consequences are immense. So what I want to say is that, okay, listening is good, and uh, because we always talk about stories and narratives and stories, yes, listening to a story is important, but then you have to do something with that. Just listening to it, okay, it will take off the, 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 the intense mo emotions of, the, of that moment, but then they will come again. So Hestia Hellas is very actively participating in delivering good quality psychosocial support services with experienced psychologists and psychotherapists who are trained in combining individual psychotherapy with group psychotherapy. This combination covers all aspects of someone's personality traits and works on personal, social, cultural, spiritual issues within a safe space. We try to respect cultural and religious beliefs in the creation of the groups that I mentioned. We know that the wish of the people that we are seeing is to leave Greece. For reasons that do not have anything to do with Greece as a country, but with the reality that Greek people themselves have to deal with every day, namely the economic crisis and all that it brings with it. I mean, Greece is exporting youth and importing other youth from other countries. Uh, it's a bit sad, but that's the reality. So at Hestia, we also provide physiotherapy and reflexology therapeutic sessions as we are committed to combining psychological and physical therapy. Many of our beneficiaries have experienced physical trauma as well as mental trauma. So working on both wounds at the same time has better results. So what do I have to recommend? I actually talked to a few uh, young migrants that we see um, and other social worker from other organizations as well as our own. So I have this to recommend. 
which is easy and immediate access to free healthcare from the moment they enter the country, faster processes in order to move the minors from camps to unaccompanied minor shelters, and faster pro processes for family reunifications. They take ages and the people, young people or uh, minor uh, children, they just wait and wait and wait so long. So um, access to education and proper support through integration classes, enough funding for shelters to be operational, and funding to organizations like Hestia allows to keep doing the work they are doing. It is very important for these people who have been through multiple traumas and they are traumatized again in countries, in the hosting countries because of all these things that take enormous time to be done. So let me show you here what the young, uh, young people told me. Their first response was that they want faster processes. We need an answer now, they said. We need to know if we are going to be allowed to live in this country in order to start learning the language and invest, investing in our lives as citizens of Greece. It's another thing what they have in mind about if they don't find a job if they, or if they don't find somewhere to study that they, they'll go away. So, and this last thing here that uh, someone said is, I, f I am a refugee here, I don't feel as a citizen, people look at me differently. It's something that I've heard it from every, everybody that I've seen at least. And that's really uh, something that we should uh, consider. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before I give the floor to the other participants, do you wanna um, give another kind of a last line of that we'd like to underline uh, what you would like to recommend. You did give your recommendations on, the, on education. You give basically more about the health and also also on the orientation upon arrival in Australia. But if you would, you would, would like to add something, anything, or you are satisfied with all? Okay, then uh, please, if you want. Okay. Uh, I think what's clear just in terms of our experience and also in talking to youth is that their sense of uh, well-being, uh, what we often call is resilience, also lots of buzzwords within the NGO community, we could call survival, it's very much connected to their family's uh, stability. And so my, uh, also my big recommendation is let us support these families to live more than at the very basic level. It reduces the tension and the stresses within the families which are then transferred to the youth, whether through relationships that are very tense or whether having to uh, be the breadwinners for that family uh, and forego other basic things uh, that will definitely affect their future, such as education, healthcare, uh, and basically their choices. So by supporting families, communities, we will also support youth uh, who are obviously uh, affected by these things. Thank you. Thank you. Now the floor is open for the question, comments and suggestion. Do we have anybody from the floor that would like to... Yeah, please, Ireland. Please, sorry, I didn't see you immediately. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. And first of all, uh, many thanks to the panelists. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's always very... Um, Humbling, I suppose, is one of those words that people use in the Oscar ceremonies, and it's a horrible word. But when you hear people who are at the coalface of helping, it is uh, an impressive experience. Um, just a question for Arania. You, you had mentioned that there are five fears, and then you put four of them up and said you'll see the fifth. Um, is the fifth this fear of not knowing what the future is, or is it something else? Thank you. Okay, so um, it's actually a fear. It's the fear of insult and betrayal, which um, can, I, after the fear of disorientation, we have either fear of abandonment or this one, when uh, someone has been insulted in his personality. So all of these things we all go through when we go through major changes, but imagine all of this combined with the trauma in the country of origin and the journey plus the insecurity in the country 
like in Greece when they arrive. So all of this really affect the future anyway, especially if someone does not do something with all this. Did I, did I respond to your question? Absolutely, yes. I, I, I wasn't sure whether there was another slide that hadn't appeared, but it, it effectively was there. Yeah, but it I, was I, there. I, it I thought was it was kind of a subset of the fear of abandonment, but it is the fifth fear. Thank you. UNFPA, please. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Fruin from the UNFPA office, and I know that um, we've been talking about um, physical and psychological well-being of migrant youth in, in different settings, and the word violence has often come up. Uh, within the range of different kinds of violence, we obviously know that sexual violence is one of the th threats that um, a lot of migrant youth are facing. So I, I, I would really appreciate it if you can touch on any kind of experiences or um, um, actions that your different organizations or government is doing in the prevention, but also in terms of uh, aiding uh, those victims of sexual violence within the process of migration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, certainly, the, um, we're taking in um, cohorts from um, Central America, so and that's uh, obviously uh, got um, a number of different throws to it. But a lot of that is around, um, if you like, sort of gang violence, for want of a better expression, in um, certain countries within that um, Central American region. And we're also um, have had a lot of experience on the Horn of Africa and some of these other countries that have also had, you know, some of this, and whether it's gender-based or, or other sort of forms of violence, of course, and, and areas of, of war, which is what I kind of touched on but didn't really express in any great deal of detail because I'm not an expert, I'm not a psychologist, but we, I, we have quite, um, and I use the word sophisticated, let's call them detailed or vast or broad, uh, whatever word you want to use. I don't want to presuppose how good they are, but we have quite a wide range of torture and trauma counselling services. And I use that as a broad term because I know that that means different things to different people. And the reason we have that is, is has been part a reaction to what we've seen as well as a proactive step for what we think we're going to see next. And I think um, a very good example of that is what we've seen recently from that, that Central American cohort because we feel we've seen this sort of stuff we think we're going to see what we've seen before. And so we've um, sort of armed that moving forward. Uh, how we actually deal, that's not really my area of expertise, so I can't really sort of go into the, the mechanics, but I'd be very happy to have a chat with you offline to put you in touch with colleagues that can. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, our work within the community, we try to work both in terms of preventing this through making youth uh, and children and their families aware of, um, of inappropriate behaviors that others might do towards them, how to prevent that, and if that happens, what mechanisms are there to, prevent, to uh, support them. And on the other hand, we have a team that's uh, only uh, focused on protection issues, so that's whether with children or uh, those that are survived for, from uh, GBV incidents, and they will work directly uh, with those individuals and also with government authorities when needed, uh, medical authorities. And within that team, we have social workers and a psychologist uh, to support. So we're trying to work on both fronts, both in terms of prevention uh, and uh, reacting or treatment, if you will. Um, and as for Greece, there are some uh, programs specialized for um, people who have suffered se sexual violence. And we at Hestia, we have people like that. Um, it's not something to help to prevent because when they come to Greece, most of them, they have already been assaulted. So uh, we just need to help them work through that and uh, help them to not be victims again of such a thing if they go on to other countries. Does that answer your question? Maybe I can just contribute uh, to your uh, question uh, through my previous experience from Central Asia. I was the chief clinician in five Central Asian countries and with the countries of IM. And uh, with the countries of Central Asia, basically we did develop uh, together with the immigration center something was the pre-departure orientation 
where uh, the migrants can receive information on the threats because yes, they are very vulnerable on the w on, on, on traveling, but at the same time, once that they arrive, then actually they need to have to whom to contact and in case that something like it could happen. And then is also what was mentioned uh, by Steve, there is also post arrival orientation once when somebody coming in particular country. Of course, we are talking about those that organize in the sense they're traveling. But for those that are actually coming uh, on by themselves, that's of course uh, vulnerability is increasing. And then, um, then of course, uh, the, the question of the also, not only the uh, sexual violence, but also somebody can be trafficked and in that sense can even more exploit it. And in that particular sense, it's, a, it's a basically a number of services that uh, NGOs can provide uh, with different assistance, including IM assistance. And you have a list of totally of 15 different uh, services that somebody can receive. But what is important to understand when we're talking about uh, trafficking in human beings, uh, what is one type of exploitation is a sexual exploitation, is uh, that uh, uh, when the, it's mostly youth. And why is youth? Because they think they're untouchable, that they are young, they can do it, no problem. And then it's a question how much they're informed about each step of traveling. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, I think your question is very uh, important, that if uh, somebody uh, is, have a desire to leave the country, they actually need to learn about opportunities within the country, what's actually mentioned here, then what is the, 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 the education opportunity in the country, then what is on transit and what is on the country of uh, destination. In that sense, it's very complex and actually in that sense, each of uh, uh, parts of the roads needs to be equipped and be ready to send this information to the, to the, to the youth. We basically, also in the panel about when you talk about the use of technolo technologies, then it's those apps are very important. Uh, uh, what kind of information, because nowadays migrants do have uh, telephones with potential to attack the app. And this is something I think we need to work more to equip the migrants with information. Is there any question for the floor because I don't want to talk too long because we have one more panel to go. If somebody would like to still address the floor. No. Then we are concluding uh, this panel and then we will come to the last panel of the day and then after that we have a conclusion concluding remark. Thank you a lot for a very valuable contribution to this one. Thank you.